Uh, Dr. Asimov, uh, most people, when they think about the future, uh, try to reach out to uh, the year 2000. Let's try 500 years from now. What kind of planet do you see? One of two, depending on what happens by the year 2000. If by the year 2000 we have not solved the problems that face us today, then I would say 500 years we'll see a world containing a technological civilization in ruins in which there will be a relatively small number of human beings uh, sort of surviving and with New York City as the most magnificent ruin in the history of the human race. And the other is? If we succeed, if we succeed in solving our problems today, then 500 years now we can well be living in a kind of utopia, a world with a relatively small population uh, carefully husbanding their resources with a working colony on the moon and perhaps on Mars reaching out to the entire solar system taking advantage of advances in technology we now can't even imagine living under conditions which when they look back on the present they will be horrified and wonder how we could have survived. Well it's perhaps not important that every human being thinks so uh, how about the leaders thinking so? How about the opinion makers thinking so? Ordinary people might follow them if we didn't have leaders who were thinking in exactly the opposite way. If we didn't have people who were shouting hatred and suspicion of foreigners. If we didn't have people who were shouting that it's more important, it's more important to be unfriendly than to be friendly. If we didn't have people shouting somehow that the people inside the country who don't look exactly the way the rest of us look, something's wrong with them. Again, again, it's almost not necessary for us to do good. It's only necessary for us to stop doing evil, for goodness sakes. Well, I would choose the last one phrase that I wrote when I was 21, which was in a way a steal from uh, Samuel Johnson, who said patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. Mm. Uh, in other words, when you get a guy right down where, where you have him backed up against the wall, he says, I did it for national security. Mm -hmm. I remember a president who said it. Yeah. But uh, what I said was that violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. I Probably mean, true. Image to course, allow yeah. to yeah. allow a dispute to come to the point of violence means that someone wasn't smart enough yeah. to settle the matter before then. Which and uh, oh, you know, which writ, which is, is writ large the large enough. problem we have, whether we're collectively smart enough not to destroy right. ourselves. And One kid country. wrote to me and said, "A violence is the last refuge of the incompetent." Why is there so much violence in the world? And why are there so many incompetent? And I wrote back, "Was there so many incompetent?" Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, on the contrary, that assumes that human beings have no feeling about what is right and wrong. Uh, as the only reason, is the only reason you are virtuous because that's your ticket to heaven? Is the only reason you don't beat your children to death because you don't want to go to hell? It seems to me that it's insulting to human beings to imply that only a system of rewards and punishments can keep you a decent human being. Isn't it conceivable a person wants to be a decent human being because that way he feels better, because that way the world is better? I would like to think, I don't believe that I'm ever going to heaven or hell. I think that when I die, there will be nothingness. That's what I firmly believe. That does not mean that I have the impulse to go out and rob and steal and rape and everything else because I don't fear punishment. For one thing, I feel worldly. I fear worldly punishment, and for a second thing, I fear the punishment of my own conscience. I have a conscience; it doesn't depend on religion, and I think it's so with other people too. Besides, even in societies in which religion is very powerful, there's no shortage of crime and sin and misery and terrible things happening, despite heaven and hell. I mean, I imagine if you go down death row, a bunch of murderers maybe who are waiting for execution and ask them if they believe in God. They'll tell you yes. Uh, I feel that, uh, as seems to me any civilized humane person should feel, is that every person has a right to his own beliefs and his own securities and his own likings. 
uh, what I'm against is attempting to place uh, a person's belief system onto the nation or the world generally. Uh, you know, we object because we say constantly that the Soviet Union is trying to dominate the world, communize the world. Well, you know, the United States, I hope, is trying to democratize the world. But uh, I certainly would be very much against trying to Christianize the world or to Islamize it or to Judaize it or anything of the sort. And my objection to, the, to fundamentalism is not that they are fundamentalists, but that essentially they want me to be a fundamentalist too. Now, I can imagine they object. They say, I believe that evolution is true, and I want everyone to believe that evolution is true. But I don't want everyone to believe that evolution is true. I want them to study what we say about evolution, decide for themselves. Now, they say they want to teach creationism on an equal basis, but they can't. It's not a science. You can teach creationism in the churches, in the uh, courses on religion. I mean, they would be horrified if I were to suggest that in the churches they teach secular humanism as an alternate way of looking at the universe, or they teach evolution as an alternate way of considering how, the, how life may have started. Uh, in the church, they teach only what they believe, and rightly so, I suppose. But on the other hand, in schools, in science courses, we've got to teach what scientists think is the, uh, is the way the universe works. The one thing that the Bible isn't, that some people seem to think it is, it's not a biology textbook, it's not an astronomy textbook. The first, the first chapter of Genesis, the first couple of chapters of Genesis are uh, the 6th century B.C. version of how the world might have started. We've improved on that since. I don't believe that those are God's words. Those are the words of men trying to make the most sense that they could out of, out of the information they had at the time. You don't buy Adam and Eve either. No, I don't buy Adam and Eve either. Uh, but... Uh, it's undoubtedly a legend which has some significance, but it's not historical. What about the life of Christ? Well, Jesus. Well, this of course is in historic times. It's at the time when the when the uh, Roman Empire was at its height. And the thing about it is that all the only information we have about the life of of Jesus is in the Gospels, in the New Testament Gospels. There's no reference to him in any literature outside. There's one dubious paragraph in the histories of Josephus, which may have Is that been... right? There's no reference to Jesus other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? And, of course, in, in, in the rest of the Bible, the, 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 epistle, yeah, right. the epistles of Paul, Acts to the right, Apostles. Right, right. But outside the sacred writings, absolutely no mention. No historian who was not... <laughs> who, was not who, who was not a Christian, let's yeah. put it that way. Not in Bethlehem. No one left any writings of any kind. None. None. This doesn't mean that he didn't exist. The chances are he did. There were many people at the time who were, what should we say, messianic, mm -hmm. uh, who were believed to be messiahs by one group or another. And uh, Jesus survived in the, as a messiah. Incredible impact for someone who got such little notice at the time from historians, right? Well, that's true, but uh, that's, the way, that's the way sometimes it works out. Uh, when, when Mohammed also received little notice outside of Arabia. And uh, I dare say many founders of great religions were dismissed by people of the time, except those who believed in them as just one more kook. Well, for one thing, it's easier. Uh, to be irrational gives you certain answers. Anyone would rather go to somebody who'll say two plus two equals five, and there's no mistake about it, than to go to someone who says, well, modern scientific research says that 2 plus 2 is usually 4, but we can't always be certain, of course. They'll go for the certainty, even if it's wrong. Uh, it depends on what you, what you promise. Why do people go out and buy fakes, fake oil stock of all kinds? Con men always get rich. They sell people all kinds of ridiculous things. They play all kinds of games which just take money away. Why? Because in each case, they promise that the person will make a lot of money. And the eagerness to get rich easy 
the get-rich-quick schemes that people fall for and what they lose money over. Well, this is a kind of a get-rich-quick scheme of the mind. These are con men of the spirit, if you will. They're selling you something, a false security that sounds good, knowledge of the future that doesn't really exist, assurance that you'll be safe when you're not really safe, and you'll give them all the money you can in return for it. Same thing like, the, like, like betting which pea is under which shell. Do you see any, any room for reconciling the two world views, the, the religious view, the biblical view of the universe as God's drama constantly interrupted and rewritten by divine intervention, and the view of the universe as scientists hold it, uh, always having to be subjected to the test of observation and experimentation. Is there any room for reconciling? Well, there is if people are reasonable about this. There are many scientists who are honestly religious. You can rattle off the names of them. Millikan was a truly religious man. Morley of the Michelson-Morley experiment was truly religious. There were hundreds of others who did great scientific work, good scientific work, and at the same time were religious. But they did not mix their religion and science. In other words, they did not presume that if something they didn't understand took place in science, they could dismiss it by saying, well, that's what God wants. Or, at this point, a miracle took place. No, no. Uh, they know that science is strictly a construct of the human mind working according to the laws of nature. And that Religion is something that lies outside and may embrace uh, science. Uh, well, on the other hand, you know, if there were suddenly to arise evidence, scientific confirmable evidence, that God exists, then we'd have no choice. Scientists would have no choice but to accept that fact. On the other hand, the fundamentalists don't admit the possibility of evidence, let us say, that would show that evolution exists. Because any evolution, any evidence you present, they will deny if it conflicts with the word of God as they see, think it to be. So that uh, the chances of compromise are only on one side. And therefore, I doubt that it will take place. The first thing that's important about Halley's Comet is that it was the first comet to have its orbit worked out and its return predicted. That made an enormous splash in the 18th century because until then, nothing had been known about comets. They were very mysterious. People were scared of them. They were omens. They were omens of unusual things happening, and unusual things are always catastrophes. But once you can show they follow a fixed orbit and come back at predictable times, there's nothing mysterious about them anymore. And so that was the doorway into studying comets as a simple, ordinary astronomical phenomena. And then the other importance about them is that it's the largest and brightest of the short-term, uh, short-period comets. The only ones that are larger and brighter come in from way out there. And when was the last time that we saw it? 1910. 1910. Yes. It was a much better show then than this one is now because it, was, it passed Earth closer to it so that it looked larger and brighter. So this is a big deal? Uh, well, it's a big deal this year. For our, for our astronomers because for the first time in history they're going to be sending out probes to pass close by Halley's Comet and study it. Study it. The Soviets are doing a better job than we are of doing that, aren't they? Well, let's say human beings are sending out four probes. It doesn't matter the nationalities. There are two Soviets, one Japanese, one West European. Yeah. The West European, named Jato, will come closest. It'll pass within 500 miles. But whatever material they find out, whatever be shared, details, so shared by the international scientific that's community. That's right. That's right. So that human beings are doing it. But then you see, in science fiction, you're allowed to depart from scientific possibility, provided you know that you're departing from it and can explain it. The reader will go along with you into the realm of fantasy if you'll give him an excuse. But to do it 
without realizing you are going into fantasy is insulting to the intelligent reader. But of course this is what frightens uh, many, many believers. They see science as uh, uncertain, always tentative, always subject to revisionism. They see science as a complex and chilling and enormous uh, universe ruled by chance and, uh, and impersonal laws. They see science as dangerous. That is really the glory of science, that science is tentative, that it is not certain, that it is subject to change. What is really, in my way of thinking, disgraceful is to have a set of beliefs that you think is absolute and has been so from the start and can't change, where you simply won't listen to evidence. You say, if the evidence agrees with me, it's not necessary. If it doesn't agree with me, it's false. This is the legendary remark of Omar when they captured Alexandria and asked what to do with the library. He said, if the books agree with the Koran, they are not necessary and may be burned. If they disagree with the Koran, they are pernicious and must be burned. Well, there, is, there are still these Omar-like thinkers who think that all of knowledge will fit into one book called the Bible and refuse to allow that there is even the conceivability of an error there. That, to my way of thinking, is much more dangerous than a, than a system of knowledge which is tentative and uncertain. For two reasons. In the first place, I have to live with myself. I feel that since I do appreciate rationality, I do believe I have a kind of ability to be a skeptic to insist on evidence, to want things to make sense. I have the duty to say so, just as some people feel that they have the call to spread God's word. I believe that if there's such a thing as God's word, it's rationality, and I have the call to spread it. And secondly, even though I don't think I'll convert the world to rationality, I may influence an occasional person here and there. And every small addition to the sum total of rationality is precious. And I would like to be responsible for as many drops as we can possibly add to that small pond. Well, the first, the first thing that's important about Halley's Comet is that it was the first comet to have its orbit worked out and its return predicted. That made an enormous splash in the 18th century because until then, nothing had been known about comets. They were very mysterious. People were scared of them. They were omens. They were omens of unusual things happening, and unusual things are always catastrophes. But once you can show they follow a fixed orbit and come back at predictable times, there's nothing mysterious about them anymore. And so that was the doorway into studying comets as a simple, ordinary astronomical phenomena. And then the other importance about them is that it's the largest and brightest of the short-term, uh, short-period comets. The only ones that are larger and brighter come in from way out there. And when was the last time that we saw it? 1910. 1910. Yes. It was a much better show then than this one is now because it, was, it passed Earth closer to it so that it looked larger and brighter. So this is a big deal? Uh, well, it's a big deal this year. For our, for our astronomers, because for the first time in history, they're going to be sending out probes to pass close by Halley's Comet and study it, study it. The as Soviets are doing a better job than we are of doing that, aren't they? Well, let's say human beings are sending out four probes. It doesn't matter the nationalities. There are two Soviets, one Japanese, one West European. Yeah. The West European, named Jato, will come closest. It'll pass within 500 miles. But whatever material they find out, whatever be shared, details. Saw, shared by the international scientific that's community. Right. That's right. So that human beings are doing it. Uh, right now, once again, they're talking about there being a wave of mysticism that's taking over in the United States. More and more people are interested in astrology, in the new way, the new something, or new age, I guess they call it, and uh, various assorted nonsenses of that sort. And I don't think there's a new recrudescence of that sort of thing. I think it's always there. I think that people have never stopped believing in anything 
that has no germ of sense to it. And with New York City as the most magnificent ruin in the history of the human race. And the other is? If we succeed, if we succeed in solving our problems today, then 500 years now we can well be living in a kind of utopia, a world with a relatively small population, uh, carefully husbanding their resources, with a working colony on the moon and perhaps on Mars, reaching out to the entire solar system, taking advantage of advances in technology we now can't even imagine, living under conditions which, when they look back on the present, they will be horrified and wonder how we could have survived. Well, it's perhaps not important that every human being thinks so. Uh, how about the leaders thinking so? How about the opinion makers thinking so? Ordinary people might follow them if we didn't have leaders who were thinking in exactly the opposite way. If we didn't have people who were shouting hatred and suspicion of foreigners. If we didn't have people who were shouting that it's more important. It's more important to be unfriendly than to be friendly. If we didn't have people shouting somehow that the people inside the country who don't look exactly the way the rest of us look, if something's wrong with them. Again, again, it's almost not necessary. A dispute to come to the point of violence means that someone wasn't smart enough yeah. to settle the matter before then. Which and uh, oh, you know which writ, which is writ large the large problem we have whether we're collectively smart enough not to destroy right. ourselves in a one kid sense. wrote to me and said a violence is the last refuge of the incompetent why is there so much violence in the world and why are there so many incompetent and i wrote back because there's so many incompetent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well on the contrary that assumes that human beings have no feeling about what is right and wrong uh, as the only way for us to do good, it's the only necessary for us to stop doing evil, for goodness sakes. Well, I would choose the last one phrase that I wrote when I was 21, which was in a way a steal from uh, Samuel Johnson, who said patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. Mm. Uh, in other words, when you get a guy right down where, where you have him backed up against the wall, he says, I did it for national security. Mm -hmm. I remember a president who said it. Yeah. But uh, what I said was that violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. I Probably mean, true. Image to question. allow... To yeah. allow uh, Dr. Asimov, uh, most people, when they think about the future, uh, try to reach out to uh, the year 2000. Let's try 500 years from now. What kind of planet do you see? One of two, depending on what happens by the year 2000. If by the year 2000 we have not solved the problems that face us today, then I would say 500 years we'll see a world containing a technological civilization in ruins, in which there will be a relatively small number of human beings uh, sort of surviving, 